To make change in civic life, you've got to activate people with story and then empower them to organize themselves into the story. Let's find out how. Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. Welcome to Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu. On this show, we look at strategies of citizen power, ways that you can affect change at the level of the community or our country. Over the course of our show, we've been looking at strategies in a few different categories, changing the game of power, changing the story of power, and changing the equation of power. Today, we're going to go deeper in an element of changing the story, a strategy that we call organizing in narratives. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean in the first place that so much of civic power, so much of politics, is about the stories we tell about ourselves, about those who are our adversaries, and that your ability to organize people so much depends on your ability to find a crystallizing, catalyzing narrative that brings people on board. There are three elements to this strategy. The first one is defining the us in play. Who is us? Who's on our side? The second is looking at power stories, ways in which a sense of how things got to be this way, why things they are, are this way, and how things could change all gets capitalized and wrapped into an arc of narrative. And finally, the idea of activating the hero spirit in every citizen and a belief that they can make change, that you can make change. Well, let's start with this question, who is us? In some ways, this is the elemental question of all politics. Who's us? How do we define us when we think about us and them? Sometimes that's about party. Sometimes it's about geography. Sometimes it's about ethnicity. But whatever the issue is and whatever the context is, you start with a given us. And the game of politics and civic life is always trying to expand that circle, expand the number of folks who think about themselves as being part of your group, your tribe, your team. So let's think about an issue just in the life of Seattle. Say you live in a neighborhood of single family homes. And the question on the table is, should we allow more density? Or maybe the question on the table is, should we allow a homeless encampment or a homeless shelter in our bucolic little neighborhood? If you're on the side that says, yes, we ought to, you've got to think about telling a story of who we are as a neighborhood that helps bring other folks into that fold. And that story's got to be about inclusivity and the better angels of our nature. Maybe sometimes that story will be about shaming folks who don't want to let other people into the neighborhood. But if you're on the other side of that debate, and you're thinking, no, we've got a story here to tell about what's special and unique about our neighborhood, what needs to be preserved, and that the way we bring folks into our fold here is to get them to believe that what brought them here to this neighborhood is preserving the special, unique, very fleeting character of a sense of place. All of this is about defining us in our politics. The organizer Marshall Gans, a great teacher and practitioner who has been doing this work ever since the uh, 1960s when he was organizing for the United Farm Workers, a few decades later helped Barack Obama organize his incredible grassroots army in 2008. Marshall Gans talks about there being three nested stories in community organizing, a story of self, a story of us, and a story of now. And at the heart of that arc is the story of us, figuring out how you get people to go out of their selfish sense of personal identity to a deeper sense of collective purpose. In the United States right now, you think about the changing face and voice of our country, and that's not just about increasing diversity and the demographic shifts that immigration and uh, racial change have brought, but it's also the ways in which economic inequality and concentration of wealth are stretching apart our social fabric and our sense of us. So much of our politics today is about contesting and redefining for purposes of winning victories this notion of us. Well, that brings us then to the second element of organizing in narratives, and that's what we call power stories. This idea that in so much of politics, your ability to move people depends on your ability to tell a story about how there once was a great paradise where things were working, where things were aligned, where values and interests were all uh, oriented in the same way and things worked for people, but then how that paradise got lost, how it was betrayed, how all those great fruits of that previous paradise were eliminated here. And then finally, how you, by joining me, can actually redeem this paradise and return us to the state that we once had and can have again. 
That flow, as simple and mythic as it sounds, is at the heart of so much effective political organizing, again, at the local and national level. You think about Donald Trump and his campaign in 2016. What was his slogan? What was his campaign except a story of paradise, paradise lost, and a promise now of paradise redeemed? The very idea of make America great again is one of these arcs of backward looking but also future promising stories of paradise. You think about life in our rapidly changing city right now with gentrification, neighborhoods like the International District, the Central District, Columbia City, where communities of color have been displaced and pushed out, where affordability is the issue. For a lot of those organizers trying to hang on and preserve a sense of diversity and the original character of these neighborhoods, so much of the fight is about telling the story about a paradise that used to exist, a paradise that's been lost by this rapid, reckless change, and a paradise that can be redeemed by organizing, by the mobilizing of community power. Again, so much of these stories are in the background, but when you think about what makes things work, whether it's for Trump, or whether for neighborhood activists here in Seattle, you begin to see the ways in which these narratives pop out. Well, then the next and final element of organizing in narratives is this notion of heroes in real life. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean quite simply that everybody wants to be the hero of their own story. This is human nature. And when we want to be the hero of our own story, we want to respond to leaders, activists, organizers who can tell a story that makes us step into that role of the hero, of the change maker, of the redeemer. There's a great organization called the Harry Potter Alliance, founded by a young activist named Andrew Slack, which capitalized on this simple insight. And he said, let's take this structure of the Harry Potter novels, this mythic structure that's in so much of our popular culture, and let's activate the fans and the readers of Harry Potter to think of themselves as what he calls heroes in real life, to imagine themselves stepping into this role to be defenders of LGBTQ communities, to fight genocide in Darfur, to think about ways in which they can be defenders of immigrants here in the United States. They've got a campaign right now called Neville Fights Back, hashtag Neville Fights Back, in which people who are fans of Harry Potter are invited to reimagine themselves in the character of Neville, fighting against, in this case, not the characters from Harry Potter, but fighting against the forces that are trying to undermine the Paris Agreement, that are trying to deny climate change. Neville Fights Back is just one simple way of activating, particularly among a younger generation, the sense that, hey, I can be a hero too if I start showing up in civic life, if I start doing that in the company of others and organizing collectively to make change. Another one of the Harry Potter Alliance's campaigns, which tapped a different vein of popular culture, was called Superman as an Immigrant, which is so simple and is true. In fact, if you want to take it literally, Superman is an undocumented immigrant. He's here without papers. And they were able to take that notion and say, you know what, let's empathize, let's humanize. When we think about undocumented Americans, when you think about people who are called illegals, what you're talking about is Superman. What you're talking about is a hero. And there's a way in which everybody has an immigration story in this country and a way in which they can activate that heroic spirit. The Harry Potter Alliance is really good at tapping into other things like this, whether it's Superman, uh, whether it's Harry Potter itself, other things, Star Wars. They've used this material of popular culture to capture the spirit and this yearning of people to be part of their own great story. More recently in civic life, this fellow here, who you may remember, a guy named Kazir Khan, who is a member of what we think of as gold star families, families here in the United States who've lost a loved one in combat and in war. And Kazir Khan, during the Democratic Convention in 2016, went up there as a gold star father with incredible moral authority, talking not only about the hero who was his lost son, who died in Iraq, but talking about his notion as an immigrant, as a believer in the United States Constitution, that it was his role, that it was every viewer's role to claim the Constitution, to claim a sense of connection to the heroes who've given their lives in defense of the Constitution. That wasn't just a technical defense of what was going on in politics. That wasn't just a technical critique of those who were nativist or anti-immigrant. It was trying to, again, awaken this heroic spirit. Well, these notions of organizing and narratives and the ways that you think about all of these strategies, they play out here in our life and in our community here in Seattle. Let's look at one particular story about immigrants, food, and the changing nature of culture and power here in Seattle. We're trying to connect and empower communities. 
I'm Philip Dang, and I'm the founder and executive director of MarketShare. We want to build an international street food market for low-income immigrants and refugee entrepreneurs. A place to gather, experience culture through food. I mean, if you just arrived here uh, you know, a few months ago and you have a few hundred dollars in your bank account, but you ran a, a wonderful restaurant for years in, in your home country, um, it's really a, a, a lot to ask of that person to try to restart that on their own here. We're trying to help lower the barriers. We know that there are folks that are business incubation experts, immigrant refugee service providers, culinary training experts. What emerges is a, a facility that is embraced by the community, that was designed by the community, meets its needs, um, therefore is more sustainable and just beloved by the people that finally receive it. We're looking at people right now who are prohibited from starting businesses because of systemic barrier. Lack of capital, language. As a city, we profess a desire to be together and to be diverse and to be equitable. Uh, yet it is really quite separate when, when it gets down to uh, how we eat and how we spend our, our time and, and how, who, who we meet over meals. And why isn't the Whole Foods crowd mingling with the food bank crowd. Market Share is, uh, it was inspired by a series of my life experiences, most notably working in nonprofits in the Asia Pacific region. So in Asia, um, I developed a love of food and culture and also an appreciation of street food culture in, in that region and then also working on President Obama's uh, campaign in 2012. And on President Obama's campaign I developed um, the skills and passion for grassroots community organizing. What I think we can do through storytelling, just like campaigns do, is go into the community and say, look, we have this space, we have these needs, what is our community narrative? What is our story? We have to challenge the status quo. We wonder why we only have one Pike Place market, uh, really, in the whole country. And it's because we've gotten away from that coming together as a community. We have food halls. We don't have public markets. We want to be able to say this is an example of how we organized a community to create a better public space. It's folks that uh, I meet out at a, a festival and who talk to me for two minutes and then write me an email and pretty soon they're heavily involved volunteers, their organizations are helping us, they're connecting us with grant making opportunities. Right now we're in this moment where immigrants and refugees are, are feeling a lot less safe than, than they were and I think a lot of people want to be um, they want to show solidarity and they want to do so tangibly. Uh, I think food is a way that allows people to connect. So that's what that space is and place to experience culture through food, um, but really just be together to have civic dialogue, civic conversation. Here to talk with us further about organizing and narratives, especially in Seattle today, is my guest, Marcus Green, who's the founder and editor-in-chief of the South Seattle Emerald. Marcus, welcome. A pleasure to be here. So um, tell us about the Emerald and how it came to be. It's only a few years old. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little over three and a half years old. Um, I originally founded it after a, a stint in the investment world. I, I came back home, uh, wanted to do something that I thought it was purposeful, and telling stories of my neighborhood and the place that I grew up in uh, was that purpose. Uh, you, you've spoken earlier about ways in which it wasn't just that you wanted to come home, but that you felt that home, Rainier Beach, where you grew up mm -hmm. in South Seattle generally, was subject to a very distorted sense of story, right? Mm -hmm. It was all negative stories, all about blight or crime or mm -hmm. violence or gangs. And part of the responsibility you felt to actually offer a countervailing set of stories about the the positive, right? Right. I mean, we are the, you know, the, the old cliche, you are the stories that you tell yourself and, and about yourself. And for me, I was tired of someone else, some other organization that 
was, was not embedded in the area, telling stories about it um, in, in a very sensationalistic manner. Um, for me, I wanted to tell the everyday, the, the, the routine, the, um, because there is beauty in the everyday. Yeah, there is beauty in the routine. And for us uh, at the Emerald, it was not about telling, talking about the, the, the death there, as we say, uh, that, you know, that, that passes for coverage over area. Uh, it was about talking the life there, because there, it's an extremely rich life that uh, people live there. And the thing about chronicling these kinds of stories of life and creation and everyday life in a community like uh, Rainier Beach or South Seattle generally is you create a positive feedback loop, right? Because it's not just that you're reporting these stories, it's that people see these stories, right? Absolutely. And yeah. they see themselves reflected and that changes the way people think about their own place uh, in neighborhood. Absolutely. I tell a story often of, um, of a young man who I, I met uh, uh, a few days after I came back, actually, from uh, L.A. at the Hedge Fund World. Um, and he said, uh, I, I, we got into a discussion, and I said, uh, you know, what do you think is good about your neighborhood here? And he said, there's nothing good about it, nothing at all. And I said, why? He said, because they, they tell me that there isn't, and I don't see anything, you know. And um, actually, a few weeks later, I found out that the young man um, was killed in a... Uh, um, in a robbery, unfortunately. Um, he was trying to rob somebody, and it didn't turn out great. Um, and to this day, I always think, you know, and, and maybe this is a bit too, too much of a, of a pat on the back for what we do at the Emerald, but I always think, what if there would have been an Emerald around to tell, you know, this young man um, stories of his neighborhood that were happening right under his nose? Well, his haunting line that, you know, that they tell us that there's nothing good about this neighborhood. Um, you know, the they there is an amorphous right. power structure out there that is framing a dominant narrative about what you can and can't be, right? Uh, but part of your work here is kind of countering that they with an us, right? right? With a different us, right? Um, and the other dimension of what's interesting about your work at the Emerald right now is that that us is changing, right? South Seattle <laughs> is in incredible flux right now. Gentrification, yeah. different sh kinds of diversity and change. How are you grappling with the changing notion of us? Because it's not a fixed, static uh, neighborhood. No, it is not. It, it, it is definitely evolving, shall we say. Um, uh, an intern of mine recently said, uh, Mr. Green, do you feel that all you're doing is documenting the death crawl of a community that used to be? And, and will you one day just be the, the Kent Emerald, and you know, I didn't really know what to say to that, but I did. That's a good question from an intern. <laughs> Hire that intern. <laughs> that I, I might have to, Ellis, if you're watching here. Um, no, but uh, I think of terms of, of the word unity, and unity being not um, that we all agree, or, or that we are all somehow, um, uh, you know, somehow bound by the the same thought process. I think of unity in the sense that we are all willing to be in a room together to talk about these problems and. Here's the thing, you have people who are, are new to the area, people who have, have been there for 15 years, people who have been there for 30. And at the end of the day, they all, wherever they're coming from in their vantage points, uh, they all love th this area. They all want to continue to be here. Most of them have moved because of the, moved to the area originally because of the diversity. And then you have other people who are like, okay, now we're less diverse because <laughs> these people have moved here. But at the end of the day, I think you have people who are attempting to buy in to a sense of community and, and define what that community is and it being like, okay, yes, I do realize that, you know, I, I just moved here two years ago and I, and I do work at Amazon. But at the end of the day, I am attempting to be a part of this community, meaning I am attempting to not only go to um, the various social uh, hubs and, you know, coffee shops, working class places of this area, but I'm trying to, to give back by showing up for those uh, yeah. in, in the community and who maybe can't show up. about this is you're, you're breaking out of a frame of just us, the old timers, and them, the newcomers, right. at, at odds with each other. You're trying to create a bigger circle of us that says, hey, Absolutely. we're all here together trying to figure it out together, how to preserve what was good, but also, um, you know, gr grapple with these changes. And um, as you think about the ways in which, in your chronicling, um, different interest groups, citizens, activists, uh, organizers in the neighborhood are using story right. uh, to try to create power. Um, who comes to mind as particularly effective at that right now in South Seattle? I would say uh, the group, the environmental justice group Got Green, which is based in Columbia City. Uh, they're, they're great about uh, putting, um, 
people of color, LGBTQIA+, people, poor whites, um, to the forefront in um, their activism work and in, in the activism uh, and environmental um, policies, you know, being enacted at both the state and uh, county and uh, city level. I'd also say there's a grandmother group um, called the Kinship Caregivers who are in Skyway, um, you know, an area that we cover with the Emerald, who originally, um, after uh, what has been, I believe, a 10-year struggle, has, has finally um, gotten the state to eliminate a means test on uh, benefits for their children, their grandchildren that they are raising. Um, the Washington state was only one of four states in the United States to, to you know, have this sort of prohibitive means test on. Uh, both, both these examples on, really, um, you know, cut to uh, what in our fi final seconds here mm -hmm. um, is something that you've said to me before when the cameras weren't rolling mm -hmm. uh, about your responsibility as a journalist, as a storyteller, which is more than just to speak truth to power. T t tell me, tell me how you phrase that. Uh, real briefly. Right, right. I, I say that the maximum journalism is that uh, your job is to speak uh, truth to power. However, I, I, I say that it's honestly to speak truth to the powerless or those who believe that they are powerless. It reminds them that they are not, that they have efficacy in this life. Mm. Well, uh, Marcus, your work and the work of the South Seattle Emerald is proof of that and uh, ways in which uh, storytelling is not just a one directional uh, act, but it creates this positive feedback loop of, uh, of bottom up civic power. So thanks for all you're doing. Oh, thank you for having me. My guest today has been Marcus Green. He's the founder and editor in chief of the South Seattle Emerald and a great practitioner of organizing in narrative. Today, we've been talking about a strategy of citizen power called organizing in narratives. And to recap, that means in the first place, activating a bigger sense of us, who's gonna be on your side in the change that you wanna make. Secondly, it's about creating the sense of paradise lost, but also paradise redeemed in the stories that you tell. And then finally, emphasis on the cape here, it's about activating the hero spirit in civic change, the idea that everybody wants to be the hero of their own story and part of a story that's greater than themselves. All of these elements come into play, whether you're in the life of a neighborhood in Seattle or in national politics or in things that even aren't about politics, but just about neighborhood change and social change. Organizing in narratives activates the power of story and invites people to be part of that story to generate power. Well, every episode, we spend some time answering your questions here that come in via social media. So let's take three that we've gotten here today. The first one comes from VJ on Facebook, and it's a good one. How do we show up as allies while not co-opting a liberative cause? How do we name privilege and stand in the struggle at the same time? One of the things that's interesting about this question is that VJ kind of answers it in the way he asks it. You think about issues, for instance, like the ways in which immigrants and refugees are disfavored. You think about issues like homelessness in Seattle, where people are seen as not fully human. You think about all the folks who want to be allies to these disfavored groups. It's a really interesting balance to think about how do you support them without necessarily stepping in front of them. And I think the way that Vijay phrased this question, these elements are key. In the first place, those who have privilege must name that privilege, must own it, must be candid about the ways in which they have that privilege. But then secondly, it means not getting in the way and standing in the struggle with those folks who, on whose behalf you are speaking, on whose behalf you want to activate your own citizen power. On Vijay actually is somebody who I know who in Los Angeles has started something called the Street Symphony. He's a musician. And he decided in the first place to start bringing music and concerts to homeless communities on Skid Row. But then beyond that, he decided to get out of the way and allow folks in that homeless community to create the music and even more than create the music, to begin using that experience of making music to build the social capital and the power to begin advocating for themselves for change and improvements in their conditions and in their lives on Skid Row. That's a good way, I think, of being an ally, activating power, bringing resources to the table without being the savior or the one who steps in as their spokesperson. That is key in all of this work of social justice right now. A second question comes in here, which I think is really also very interesting. How do we separate the principle of the Constitution from the hypocrisy of the founding fathers who were slave owners? This comes in from Lou Rochelle via Facebook. And actually, in the fuller version of her question, she called our founding fathers not just slave owners, but sex traffickers. And you may argue about uh, the phrasing of these things, but there's no question when you think about someone paradigmatically like Thomas Jefferson, who was both the author of the Declaration of Independence and a slave owner, and somebody who was having a relationship not only with what people call his mistress, Sally Hemings, but his slave, his property, 
who was raping his property, Sally Hemings. How do we reconcile all of this? Well, in the case of Jefferson, you think about someone who is a very active voice on this issue right now, the historian Annette Gordon-Reed, who teaches at Harvard Law School, who's written about Sally Hemings, who in fact uncovered a great deal of the history and the true full dimension of her life, but who also has been insisting in her writing and in her work that this is something other than pure hypocrisy that can be dismissed. This was a sense in which those values and those principles that Jefferson and other framers and founders are articulated are principles still worth trying to hold ourselves up to, still worth trying to live up to, while recognizing in as clear-eyed and unflinching a way the ways in which not only were those individuals hypocrites, but ways in which they at the time were wrestling with their own hypocrisy. And Thomas Jefferson and other slaveholders among that generation knew that slavery was wrong, and yet they did nothing about it. George Washington knew that slavery was wrong, and yet he did nothing to end it in his public life. Does that mean that we should ignore everything they said? Or does that mean that now it falls to our generation to force them and to force us to live up to those words and to name them in their hypocrisy, but also to recognize that what they gave us in this creed, in this language of the Constitution and the Declaration, a set of obligations that every succeeding generation of Americans has to try to live up to. It's not easy, and it's not a neat story, but the messiness of that is something that we as Americans are both blessed and cursed to have to reckon with. Finally, our third question today comes from Matt on Twitter. What's a good starting point or minimum knowledge base every citizen should know about our country? Well, actually, I appreciate this question for a few reasons, but one is that we've actually started a project recently called What Every American Should Know. And it starts from the premise not only that civic education has been in decline, that so many Americans are ignorant about the basics of civic life, the basics of how government works, three branches of government, the separation of powers and so forth, but Americans also increasingly in our ever more diverse and pulled apart country don't have a common base of knowledge, a common vocabulary about our history, about our shared culture, about our past and about our future. And so the What Every American Should Know project invites all of us to think about ways in which we can contribute collectively in a crowdsourced way to a base of knowledge that we feel like every citizen ought to know, not only about how a bill becomes a law, but about parts of our history, like Sally Hemings, parts of our history, like the internment of Japanese Americans that maybe have been brushed under the rug for too long and that have special pertinence in our times today. This project is an invitation to all of us to be authors of what every American should know. But in addition to a project like that, there's no question that basic civic education of the kind that used to exist in our public schools and is now declining is something we've got to reemphasize. And we got to do that whether or not we have kids in the schools, but just as citizens who are concerned about whether future generations will understand the fundamental responsibilities of self-government. We hope you'll keep on sending your questions and your thoughts and ideas to us via social media. You can get us on Twitter, via Facebook, or just email at contact at seattlechannel.org. And that's our way of communicating with you. And we hope that throughout this episode, as ideas have come to you about the work that we're doing together in our community, you'll be you won't be shy about sharing those ideas and questions with us. Thanks for watching Citizen University TV. Thanks for being part of this community. Let's go make change together.